Hey YouTube, this is Brian. Today we're going to be talking about some more advanced things that you can do in Jupyter Notebooks. We're going to cover Jupyter Notebook extensions. They do exactly what the name suggests. They extend the functionality of Jupyter Notebooks and will give you some things that you might be expecting based on experience with other IDEs. We'll talk just a little bit about configuring Jupyter. Mainly what I'm going to do here is just give you links for more information just because they're a little bit beyond the scope of a 10 minute video. But there are some things that you can do when it comes to version control and when it comes to running a remote server version of Jupyter that will make your life easier. So we'll touch on those a little bit. And then we'll go over some other tips and tricks that I wish that I had known about when I first started using Jupyter just because again they're gonna make your life so much easier and it's gonna make using Jupyter a lot better. So with that said, let's get started. As I mentioned, the first thing that we're going to be talking about are notebook extensions. I just started using these a little while ago. I'm almost embarrassed to admit that because they're so helpful. When I first came across them, I thought, oh, this is going to be a hassle to install and it's going to be a lot of troubleshooting time for not a lot of benefit. I was completely wrong. Um, what you'll see is that, again, they add some of the functionality that you might expect from other IDEs, but then they do some notebook specific things that are just going to make your life easier. Installing the notebook extensions, like I said, is a lot less painful than it sounds when you first read through the instructions. And really, the instructions don't sound that painful, but sometimes we've, you know, we've got a sense of learned helplessness where we've come to expect some things are going to be difficult. And this is one of those things that kind of sounded like it might be difficult just because of the extra work that is behind the scenes. So, you know, there'd be some sort of troubleshooting, some sort of configuring that would have to happen. Nope, it's good. You have essentially three steps, really two. Uh, the first involves installing the Jupyter extensions package, and you, would so you install that just like you would any other module or package for Python with pip install. You can do it with Conda. I, as I've mentioned in other videos, I prefer to use pip just because I like having the newest thing and I don't usually run into conflicts. In fact, I can't think of a time that I've run into a conflict using pip versus Conda. The second thing you're going to do is install some additional files that will make the extensions display and work properly in your notebook. And that's really all that you need to do. There's a third step here, but it's really for manually enabling and disabling extensions. What you'll see is that once you've done those things and restarted your server, then you're going to have this new tab, NB extensions, notebook extensions, obviously. When you click on that, it's going to take you to a list of extensions and this is the place where it's actually fairly easy to manually enable and then disable your extensions. You can do it from the command line like step three in the instructions that I just walked through with you but if you come here and do it you also get to see a description of what you're enabling. So for example uh, down at the bottom you've got a description of whatever the highlighted extension is. So for example if I wanted to click on ruler and see what it did. And then obviously to enable or disable them, you just click in the checkbox. And if it has a check, it's enabled. If it doesn't, it's disabled. So over here, I've put a list of extensions that I found really helpful. As you can see, there are many more, and there may be some that I haven't listed here that will really work for you. Some of them are some of them are task some of them are task specific and aren't really the tasks that I do all the time, so you may get more use out of them than I do. A couple that I want to show you just to illustrate what extensions can do are code folding. This is something that's very common in lots of IDEs but isn't in Jupyter by default. And then there's execute time, which I think is just pretty cool. And then there's the scratch pad, which is something that I wanted and didn't even know that I really wanted. So let's switch over to our old notebook that we were working with before in the previous video. So one thing I'll show you here is this cool extension called Execute Time. You can see that I've got an extra bar down at the bottom of my cell now because I've enabled Execute Time. And when I run it, it updates to tell me how long it took for that cell to run and when the last time it ran was. That's really cool because every once in a while I get distracted as I'm running through cells in a notebook and I'll wonder if I've actually run a cell or not and you know sometimes if you run a cell again you'll overwrite something important. So that's pretty cool. The code folding extension that I mentioned does exactly what it sounds like. It adds a little error at the end 
for when you have multi-line functions and clicking on that will fold that code up and you can imagine that this is good with functions and it's good with ifs and else's. Now the other extension that I wanted to show you was Scratchpad. A lot of times when you're just doing stuff interactively and you want to find out what 1 plus 1 is, you got to add another cell and you got to go down and run it. Now you've got an extra cell and you've got some extra output in your notebook that you don't really need, you just wanted to find out what the answer to 1 plus 1 was. So let's get rid of that. What Scratchpad lets you do is it gives you, by pressing Control B, a little space to work in. So you can add this over here now, run it just the same way you would run a normal cell with Shift Enter, and then close it and get it out of your way and your notebook is, your original notebook is still nice and clean. So those are three, I think, must-have extensions, but they also illustrate what extensions can do. Okay, so those are notebook extensions. Go check them out now. You're going to get a lot of use out of them. The next thing I wanted to talk to you just a little bit about is configuring Jupyter. There are some things that you may want to do that don't necessarily work that great by default. One of those things is running Jupyter on a remote server. So for example, if you're running AWS and you want to connect to Jupyter on an AWS instance, you want to make sure that it's secure as possible. And there may be some things that you need to customize, like you might want to change the port number that you connect to. For example, you see by default, the port number is 88888. Maybe you've already got something running on that and you need to change it to 8887. Or for security reasons, you just want to change it to something unexpected. So. Jupyter documentation has a lot of information about that. It will also help you set up things like a password. It will help you set up uh, some other things that you may want to configure, especially if you're working with remote servers. I've got the link here. I'll let you go check it out. I don't want to go too far into it just because it will take us down a long path that will be beyond the scope of this video. But go check it out if you want to run Jupyter on a remote server. It will make things easier and more secure for you. We talked in an earlier video about version control and how important it was. Well, this is one of the things that Jupyter gets wrong, and it's been this way since IPython. Because Jupyter is browser-based, when you save a file, an IPython notebook file, you get a lot of extra information in that file beyond just the script. Ideally, you would have just the code, so when you change the code, it would be tracked in version control and you would be able to do a diff and know exactly what changed in the code. Those are the important changes that you care about. Well, because this is web-based, there's HTML that goes on in the background here and there's just all sorts of superfluous things. For example, the cell numbers. Each time those change and you save the file, you'll have a diff that changes this 10 to 15, for example. And so you don't really care about those, but when you're saving as IPython files, that's what you're getting. And if you're tracking those files, you're going to be tracking those as diffs. And it complicates version control a little bit because you're always getting changes regardless of whether any of the important stuff changed or not. Now you can do a couple of things to help out with that. You can have your IPython files save also as .py scripts. And so you can even just turn off the IPython tracking in your version control if you want to and just track those Python files. Or you can leave both of those on. Know that you're going to get diffs for the IPython files. Don't worry so much about those. Just look at the diffs for your Python scripts. So again, really getting it set up the way you want is beyond the scope of this. But go visit this website. It will get you started on it. It's a great uh, description of what the problem is and how to change some of your configuration files to do post save hooks they're called that will write in write files in different formats in general if you want to know more about configuring Jupyter follow this link it'll walk you through lots of different things and tell you things that you need to do to actually make some of these changes so for example you've got to make sure that you have a Jupyter config file to do this approach where you do the post save hooks. You don't have one necessarily by default. This will walk you through setting one up. Okay, so as I mentioned, I wanted to cover some additional tips and tricks that would really help your productivity. I've posted a link here to an article on datacoast.io. I came across this a month or two ago and I was just blown away by how neat most of these 28 tricks were and how much I wish that I had known them when I first started using 
Jupiter. It's just a great collection of things that are really helpful and it covers a broad swath of things that can take and uh, apply in different ways. One of the things that it covers is IPython magic. And you've already seen a little bit of this already at the top, this percent matplotlib inline. What IPython magic lets you do is access other things, sort of extended features uh, of IPython. So for example, we can do percent ls and it will run an ls function just like we were running it from the command line. So we'll get the list of files that are in this directory. We can do percent who and it will tell us all of the objects of a specific type that we have in our environment. So we do data frame for example not data farm, that won't come up with anything, data frame, and we can see that we have the data frame that we created up here. Now there's a whole list of these things that are going to get you really far. You'll see some of them in the datacoest.io site, and then if you want a list of all of them, you can type ls magic, and it'll show you all of these, and you can explore these and play with them and see what you get. So go check out that article in datacoest.io. I'll also add another article to the notes section that is very similar. It lists also some other tips and tricks that are going to really help you out and get you off to a good start with Jupiter. So that's all we're going to be talking about today. In the next video we'll get to pandas and we'll talk about pandas like I suggested that we were going to do last time <laughs> but I wanted to come back and touch on Jupiter since we weren't able to cover the advanced stuff in the previous video and this is stuff that you really, like I said, this is stuff that I really wish I'd known when I first started working with Jupiter because it would have made things a lot easier for me. All right, well, have a great day or night, whatever it is on your side of the world, and I'll talk to you later.